So this is a really cool opportunity uh, to talk with somebody in Ryan who has really been at the forefront of OZs from the early days. And I know there's all, there's other people here that have been as well. Um, but Ryan, um, I'm going to let you do your, your own intro here. The, the plan for today is to do a little moderated Q and a, um, you know, just to outline your experience and, uh, with a goal of helping people see a little bit behind the curtain of what, you know, a real estate development company and investment company is, is looking for in investments and how you've been doing this for the last, you know, three plus years. Right. So, uh, I'll let, um, I'll let you sort of tee up your own intro. I think that that's the best way for people to understand who you are and what you do. Um, and yeah, maybe talk a little bit and we can just dive right into this um, before we get into like Q and A for the second half. Um, so I appreciate everybody being here and let's uh, Ryan, let's kind of, let's kind of riff on everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, let's just start with like who you are, what you do and um, how you sort of found out about and got involved in OZs. Yeah. Um, great. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you having me on here. This is, uh, this is kind of a cool opportunity. I mean, um, to, to try to share a little bit of our, our story and um, hopefully it, it's, it's helpful and I'll try to be as candid as I can. Um, so yeah, so my name is Ryan Tobias. I'm one of the founders and managing partners here at Jackson Dearborn Partners. Uh, we're a, just a real estate investment development firm. Um, we do predominantly just um, apartments. We've done a lot of student housing in the past. Um, and now we do almost exclusively multifamily. Um, we're based in Chicago. I actually live and work out of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, uh, we've got uh, folks in, uh, in Arizona and Illinois here in Michigan. And mostly what we're, we're working on right now is in Colorado and Arizona. Um, not all Opportunity Zone, uh, but mostly Opportunity Zone. That's 70% of what we're doing is Opportunity Zone. Um, we... Um, We've got, I think we're working on our 12th Opportunity Zone project right now, um, in titling and, and you know, hoping to break ground on that in early 2023. Um, we got started in the space. Um, you know, and I, I feel like I've heard this story somewhat often. I mean, we, a little bit by happenstance and that we had some projects that we were um, planning, uh, student housing actually at the University of Illinois that we had planned. Um, back in 2017, 18. And we're just sort of long-term um, holders by nature. And so um, you went, when we found this, you know, when this program was announced as part of the Tax Cut Act, we said, well, why not basically uh, structure these, these deals that we had kind of in the queue for Opportunity Zone? Um, again, we were gonna, we were, we, you know, we were gonna do them anyway. We we're gonna hold them long-term. It didn't require any adjustment to our business plan. Um, and obviously, um, pretty strong tax benefit to to our investors and so we we did those first three deals in one singular opportunity zone fund in 2018 when you know nobody knew anything about that i mean every investor we talked to was like you know i had heard about it the day before or you know or heard about it on that very call um but we did that and then and um and really learned a lot, probably made a lot of mistakes. Um, I, I can see our attorney is on this, uh, he's, he's watching here too. And, and we've, uh, we've certainly made a lot of uh, changes. Ryan, we didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I made personally about a thousand and then uh, collectively as a group of about a hundred thousand, but, we, um, but we, we got there. I mean, this is before final regs were even out. So, I mean, you know, you couldn't, you know, you know, you didn't even know the mistakes you were making yet. Um, and so, um, and so we kind of wrote it from there and then we were already um, growing outside of, we had kind of a, a business focus to grow outside of the Midwest and outside of um, the state of Illinois and, and areas like this. And so we, we kind of used it as a little bit of a growth catalyst and, and we were looking at markets in Arizona and Colorado already. And, um, you know, we, we started looking at those opportunity zones and, and you know, started getting projects going there. And, um, and we've had good success in that. So we have, um, we have two opportunity zone projects in, in Colorado. Those are both Colorado Springs. And we have um, one, two, three, uh, two, 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 four in, um, in Phoenix, uh, two in Goodyear, one in Scottsdale and one in uh, Chandler. So 
Um, and those are all kind of uh, in various stages of either construction or uh, entitlement right now. It's, it's great. I mean, it's great to hear the, the background and that you've, you know, obviously been totally immersed in this. And uh, maybe maybe Brett can do a disclaimer for you guys, by the way. Uh, we always kind of do that and, and uh, say, right. hey, you know, like this session. That's going to be all texting me on the side to shut up at some point. Here, <laughs> yeah, you have your sensor here. Yeah. That's great. Um, but I, I do want to I do want to say that. Right. Like uh, this this content is not meant to replace, you know, uh, information directed by your attorney so please right. if you want if you're pursuing right. anything around this your tax counsel and cpa like i have to say on nor, 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 nor is it an admission of guilt either that, that's, that's right <laughs> we, we will now hold your admissions against you in the court of law <laughs> but i see i, I see we're a safe with the uh, participants on this call i, I, I hope <laughs> okay all right i see a handful of compliance speak into the phone please just speak into the phone <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, Ryan. So um, t those the projects that you talked about. I mean, um, it, it, I, I'm also interested in sort of like it sounds like you kind of maybe stumbled into this, but maybe you can elaborate on like how and why you've bought in so hard on it um, and and done so many projects. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of the program. I mean, it's it's just a um, it's again for us who are typically looking at a long term horizon. Anyway, there's a lot of developers out there that are really just kind of a merchant build type of scenario. And if, if you're looking to get in and out as quickly as possible and hit a promote, obviously the Opportunity Zone program is not necessarily the best fit for that. Although there are a lot of funds out there right now that will offer you a crystallization option to kind of simulate that. And so there, there, is, there is opportunity, um, and I'm using that word a lot, I feel like, but um, for, for developers that want to be in and out more quickly um, can do that. But for us, we're looking long term anyway, um, and we just felt like we just think it's a tremendous program. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful tax benefit. It's um, you know for for the investors uh, and for us as well. We're personally invested obviously in every project. We set up our deals to um, to have both the LP and the GP entities be qualified opportunity zone funds, and so we're personally um, you know benefiting as well. Although you know the investors obviously have a, a larger kind of pro rata share. Um, and it, you know, so it's 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 just been something that we've we've kind of jumped in with both feet um, and, and felt like it was a program that we were an early mover on, um, understood better than most, um, you know, early on, and, and that gave us a little bit of a competitive advantage in a way that you know we don't necessarily have. Like if we're going out to Phoenix to do projects, like you know, every uh, you know, name your big boy developers, they're all there. Um, doing doing projects and you know we're a smaller shop and we needed to carve out a niche and really be and have a, a focus and a way to set ourselves apart and uh the oz program has been one of those primary ways so uh the the competitive advantage right uh maybe we can dig into that a little bit and how you utilize the oz to 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 work towards your advantage i mean we've had a lot of discussions and um you know, uh, Maria de Los Angeles Rivera out of Grant Thornton uh, in, in Puerto Rico is famous for utilizing this cupcake analogy, right? Like that the OZ is the cherry on top of the frosting on top of the cupcake, right? So like you have to have a really solid cake and then you get this nice frosting. And then on top yeah. of that, you have this, this incentive. And so um, maybe you can talk about how you guys leverage that even in conversation with investors. Um, is it about picking the right investor? Is it about introducing this idea to investors? Like, how does that kind of pan out in your in your yeah. scenarios? Is it all different? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that that analogy is a good one. I mean, I think we've we've said that. I, I, I say, yeah, the cherry on top, or it, it's really just like gravy. I mean, for I mean, first and foremost, you know, the tax benefits in the program itself, like they certainly don't overcome a bad project. We talk about that a lot, right? The projects themselves have to stand up on their own. Um, and that's sort of critical. Um, you know, they, they, just because they, there's a tax benefit to the investor that really, first of all, that doesn't matter to the lender. That doesn't matter to your yield on cost. Um, you, know, you know, so all the projects need to fit and work just the same way that they would outside of the Opportunity Zone program. Um, and, and although it does, you know, when we have a longer term horizon, it does allow you to, to maybe make some decisions a little differently, maybe build a little bit higher quality, for example, um, uh, 
you know, knowing that you're going to be in this project for a long time and you want it to stand up um, and, you know, you're not as focused on like in the merchant build scenario of hitting X IRR as quickly as possible and getting in and out, um, you know, we can take a little bit, you know, a, a little bit longer term view, but yeah, projects need to stand up on their own. Um, and then, you know, these days, again, early in the process, we were doing a lot of educating investors and, and trying to like really like pitch to folks like, hey, listen, you know, you just sold a business or you just sold a piece of real estate like this program is something that you should really be looking into. Um, these days, it's, you know, because, you know, things like this and, you know, good work by the, the you know, OZ Works folks, you know, and, and, and other organizations out there like well, people know about it and um, we get more kind of inbound type stuff now where folks are like, listen, I, I love the program. I've been invested in a couple other funds. I sold a business, you know, we'd love to talk about what you guys have going on. Yeah. So uh, that, that kind of leads me into another question uh, about the projects. So, you know, when you, when you are looking for a deal that makes sense, right. The cupcake, uh, what particularly are you guys looking for um, in some of the deals and projects that, you know, that you, that you ultimately end up executing on? Yeah, I mean, again, we, we, we try to maintain the same principles of whether or not we're looking at an OZ project or not. And that, you know, we're, just, you know, good demographics and location and, and visibility, um, obviously, you know, you know, competitive rent, you know, comp set that's got rents that will support what we're talking about. And then, you know, because it's OZ, most of the time, obviously, you're looking for something, you know, a neighborhood or a submarket, an area that's, you know, it preferably is already been moving and, and will continue to be moving in, in the right direction and so that you can forecast out a, a 10 year horizon that looks even better than it does today. But we are generally, you know, we, we haven't been in, we, we we're mainly in sub markets and we feel like are already kind of on, on their way. And, and, and we hope that our projects are additional catalysts to that. Um, and, you know, like our, our project in, in downtown Chandler that we're working on right now, downtown Chandler is, a, is, a, is, is a great submarket already. Um, there are a few kind of holes in the urban fabric, and we're hoping to fill one of those. And ultimately, I think it, that tide lifts all boats down there, um, and our, you know our project will be really successful. But as will others around there as well, um, just by kind of what we're what we're doing and what others are doing, um, and some of which are also opportunity zone projects. So same kind of fundamentals that you know anyone's looking at in apartment development, um, you know for sure. Yeah. Hey, so Chris, I'm just going to throw in something here too, I, just to toot their horn a little bit. I mean, th these guys are phenomenal at finding good sites. And um, I think it's gotten exponentially harder with each year since this incentive started, you know, early on, you know, there, everyone talked about how there's 8,700 opportunity zones across the country. Um, but, you know, the Jackson Dearborn team and, and their partners, uh, at Green Street just really honed in on, on good sites and good zones. And, you know, they pick winners. I mean, this downtown Chandler site is phenomenal. I mean, it was almost a miracle you guys found that, frankly. And the downtown Scottsdale site's in Old Town Scottsdale. I mean, these are really high demand areas. These would be projects that would do extremely well and they just happen to be in opportunity zones. And um, frankly, I've never seen anyone else that I've worked with locate sites as well as these guys have. Um, and I, th I think another thing just to throw out there, you know, that they did early on was they were doing a lot of student deals. And I don't know if you want to talk about that, Ryan, but those student housing projects were great. You know, the first three or four we did in Champaign, I mean, they worked perfect for this program. Yeah, you know, student's an interesting one. And I, I thank you for that, Brett. And full disclosure, we pay your Brett's firm lots and lots of money, so he has his <laughs> anyway. Um, I'd like to think he would anyway, though, so he's a friend too. But um, yeah, the student housing is interesting because you know there is there there is an sort of an abnormally large number of opportunity zones near universities, um, and that's kind of obvious when you think about it, right? The demographics of a of a you know a student area or or you know by their very nature, somewhat low income, right? I mean, these are folks who don't work or work part-time or whatnot, they're 20 years old. Um, so there, there's been kind of quite a few, I and mean, we've only done the ones near the University of Illinois, which is kind of our backyard and, and a partner, Chris, lives in, and manages a huge portfolio right in that area. So it's kind of 
you know, back again, very, very backyard for us. But I've seen across the country um, a number of opportunities and other developers have been working on sites in various in various universities because there's sort of an outsized number of, uh, of QOZ tracks near major major universities. Uh, you mentioned getting lucky, <laughs> or Brett did. Um, yeah. and, and we, you know, I've brought this up to a lot of other developers who are being successful, you know, in, in around opportunity zones, uh, and, you know, luck, you know, lightning strikes once, you know, so, so can you tell us maybe how you locate these properties? Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, there, there there's always an element of luck, um, and, and any, and any pun in this business, it doesn't, you know. Uh, admit that is is a fool um and you know we've been really we've been we have been lucky we've, we've we've gotten some sites that have just kind of worked out obviously we're you know you create you know we create opportunities and you have to seize them when they come but we we have been quite lucky and, and listen anybody who's in multifamily, particularly in you know markets like phoenix is also just incredibly lucky with the sort of run-up um cap rate compression and rent growth and and things of that nature that have nothing to do, you know, with us. Um, but we have, you know, we've, we've, we're, like I said, we're sort of having this competitive advantage is like we're, you know, partly we are reasonably well known, at least the markets that we're in, um, that, you know, we're, we are out there looking for OZ sites. Um, you know, we're aggressive on things that we, that we really like. We move quickly. We do what we say we're going to do. We've got some great relationships with some brokers and that bring us stuff off market in some of these markets. And so, yeah, I mean, you sort of try to, Create your own luck the best you can, but you still, you still, uh, you still have to admit it. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we're we're out there. I mean, just before this, I mean, you know, one of our development guys here in the office was just scouring, going through GIS records in opportunity zones in Florida, actually, which is kind of a new growth market that we're working on. Looking at each parcel, who owns it? Is this a parcel that works for us? And we'll directly outreach um, or we'll lean on one of our broker, you know, relationships to say, hey, what about this site? Do you happen to know this guy? You know, this one's on the land trust. They've owned it for 50 years. You know, what's the situation, you know, and, and try to find those sites. And particularly because the market has gone so bonkers, like it's, it's you know, marketed stuff, marketed deals out there right now. I mean, in the markets we're in and, in, you know, in Denver and Phoenix and Tampa and things like that. Uh, you know, we have to find stuff off market. We have to kind of fish where others aren't fishing and, and make deals work because, um, you know, a zone entitled site for 300 units in, in Phoenix right now. I mean, the pricing that they're, they're commanding is, it's ludicrous. Um, and so, you know, we're, our basis on a lot of our stuff is 10, 12, 15, 20 unit. Um, and, you know, we're seeing trades in these markets at 70, 80, yeah, I mean, I heard yeah. in Tampa, a hundred thousand plus per unit, which is just crazy. Yeah. I, um, I had a conversation with, with Sean, one of your partners, uh, a few months ago, actually. And, you know, we were talking about some of those middle markets and, and how a lot of the, the markets that you're familiar with are, are really kind of like, let me just use this term drying up for OZ potential. Right. Um, and so, in these mid markets, maybe you can uh, talk about, cause I know there are quite a few people here and in our community that represent those, those communities, right? Um, so what's the best way to sort of introduce them to you or what, what is your need? <laughs> what do you look for in being able to get like immersed or introduced to some of these types of areas, right? Other than the GIS and opportunities that you all have in house, right? Cause that's powerful too. Right, right, yeah, I mean, so we, we historically, we really like sort of smaller middle type markets. I mean, we are in some major ones. I mean, we're pretty heavy in Phoenix, which is a you know poster child for a, a major market that's really surging right now. But we're really heavy and we have two OZ projects in Col Colorado Springs, which, which we think is a phenomenal market, um, sort of a little bit in Denver's shadow, but um, has just really, really similar kind of demographics and, and growth trajectories, both population and jobs. Um, you know, we have a project in, you know, Lafayette, Indiana. I mean, we, we, we like college towns. We like smaller markets um, that have a lot of the similar to, you know, the same types of things everybody's looking for, right? Like positive, you know, jobs and population growth and things of that nature, um, but maybe aren't quite as inundated as, you know, Dallas or Phoenix or Tampa or whatnot. So like even in Tampa, for example, or in Florida, we're, 
we're really looking hard in Sarasota, um, even further down Port Charlotte, Bradenton, um, areas like that that are just slightly off the beaten path. Um, I mean, there's really no secrets in Florida these days, but um, but a little more so than than being in Miami, Orlando, Tampa, et cetera. Um, so we love those types of markets. Um, we're trying to stay in our lane and be pretty focused in those three primary states, uh, Florida, Colorado, um, and Arizona. But, um, and I, I see some folks making, some, you know, chatting here and, and asking some questions. We've got a lot of uh, friends and partners in the space um, that uh, that we work with, we'll, we'll either we partner with or, or just refer. Um, it, the OZ world isn't that big. I feel like we've got a good working relationship with a lot of folks in the space. And so even if it's not necessarily a fit for us, um, like I saw somebody mention something in Memphis, for example, you know, my friend Kyle Bach and Annex Group, um, which Brett does some of their legal work as well. Um, he's, done, he's done an opportunity zone student housing deal in Memphis, for example, um, and would probably look for more. Um, and he's a good friend. So uh, there, there could be connection points. So I, I, I happily connect with anybody on this call or that's watching this and, and love to see more opportunities and less. And if, like I said, if it's not a fit for us, it could be a fit for someone we know and, and happy to just connect those dots. Yeah, and I, I have to give a shout out as well, like to uh, to to Ryan and and Sean and your whole crew. Like you you guys make time, and um, that's that's really appreciated. And it's part of obviously what the the formula and the culture is here. Like you know that lead with a giving hand thing. So at some point, maybe we just have a a call where it's like Ryan and Sean connect you with whatever you need uh -huh. in the whole country. Yeah, Sean, <laughs> my partner who's listening here. I mean, he's the, he's the super connector. I mean, he's like you know, I mean he. he loves that and um it, i'm not as good at it as he is but i mean yeah we we love to and we get a we get a rise out of out of trying to you know help folks out and, and make those connections and ultimately creating a larger cooperative kind of oz space is i, I think is beneficial for it's beneficial for us it's beneficial for everyone to have it be um you know just be more pervasive and a, and a known sort of ecosystem for investors and for brokers and for lenders and for everybody else so. yeah yeah, well, you can see why we get along so well. Um, <laughs> this whole group is is of that mindset, and uh, so I know I want to I want to shift gears a little bit um, into more of a, like an open Q and A. So we've got like eighteen people here, um, and I'm sure that there are some questions coming up. Um, I uh, I see Nita, you 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 referenced sort of her uh, comments about you know distressed properties and OZs near HPC. Well, kind of in Memphis at least. Um, Social impact is obviously a big component of what the promise of this whole incentive has been. So um, are you guys focused on that? And if so, how? I think that kind of ties in with what she's she's asking. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're, you know, I, I think that the projects that we're working on, I mean, first of all, we're, we're, we are trying to be socially impactful. And I think this, in these next, the next, the projects that we're working on now, like I'd be perfectly honest with you on the first, few deals that really wasn't it really wasn't a focus again these were projects that we already kind of had planned you know we restructured them as oz um but on the on these ones going forward it's becoming increasingly like you know in the back of our minds of like how you know what we what we can do um affordable housing i think is a big is a big factor uh, out there as, as rents rise stratospherically in some of these markets um some of the ones i mentioned here today like phoenix and tampa um, that's becoming more and more important. Um, and so that's, that's something that we are always looking to include if we can, if we can make those, if we can make those numbers work and, and I'd like to do more of that going forward. Um, and we do a lot of, you know, volunteer work here. Um, like I'm very involved in that and affordable housing here locally in our community. But yeah, I, I think that that's something that has gotten a little bit lost in the OZ conversation. And I, I'll, I will, um, plead guilty in that personally a little bit as well like we just have just trying to do great projects make them work and whatnot and uh i'd like to think that our a, a kind of next round of projects we can we can do some more socially impactful type stuff it's awesome and you know we've we've already had some discussions i've talked with sean a little bit about what we can do and what we've been doing here at Osworks group too so um so i'm, I'm encouraging everybody to put questions in the chat um and i know uh Paul is, uh, is, is a friend and he's also part of the inner workings of the compliance zone in Osworks group. And so 
Uh, I'm a little nervous because he just says I have pointed questions and he didn't actually put what the questions were. <laughs> so just so you know, Paul is very direct and uh, I appreciate that about him very much. Paul, <laughs> okay. uh, I want to say fire away. <laughs> don't be afraid of what you what you don't know, Chris. Don't be afraid. <laughs> right. Just, yeah. a, just embrace put a 90 second cap on each question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's only so weird I'm, if you make it weird. It's, it's I'm already up to weird if you make it weird. That's right. That's right. I'm exactly. No, Paul, questions. please. Uh, um, I, 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 uh, I encourage the questions and sure see thing. what you got. Uh, yeah. Uh, great to meet you this morning. Uh, I don't think we've had the chance to meet directly, but it is what it is. Um, so with regards to your, your invested model, it sounds like you prefer to control the land, do the development, uh, control the odds funding and the channels. Do you invest in other developers' projects, it's sort of as a merchant equity investor, and bring the capital to other developers' projects um, where you're not in charge of the planning and the zoning and the blueprints and everything else? Right. We we haven't to date, um, and I, I think the reason for that is mainly that you know if. if you know, I, I do a lot of the fundraising myself. And so, you know, I mean, I've got a great team behind us as well, but in, like, if I'm going to, you know, ask you to invest in a particular project it, to date it has been pretty paramount to us that, you know, that we've been involved in every step of the way and every decision made. And, and, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're getting that with that project. That being said, we, we have talked about, you know, we would be open to doing some partnership type stuff, um, I wouldn't just bring capital, um, but if, if it was a great sure. project and a great partner um, that's looking for like a co-GP type of a situation where right. then we assist with the capital, we would be open to that. But we just, you know, you just have to be so, you have to be careful with that. I mean, your your, your name and, and your reputation and whatnot and making sure that you're not just, hey, listen, here's project A, project B, project C, like we're looking for capital for all that. I mean, everything that we've done has it's, it's been, you know, soup to nuts, you know, with, yeah. with, with these projects. So. So, so one of the ventures I'm involved with is Florida-wide opportunity zones. And it involves the whole state of Florida, it's agnostic. And so I frequently come across developers that are that are inching forward, they have land control, they got deals, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're cooking the deals and then they turn to me like, where do we get the money? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to figure out out there in the opportunity zone land. Who is yeah. a merchant equity investor and who wants to own and control everything from A to Z? So, and um, you know, there's a lot of funds out there that, that obviously are, and, and you know, that are just doing that, right? They're just doing LP capital, partnering with developers yeah. like us. Um, and I'm happy to make intros there. Uh, Origin Investments, for example, is, is a partner of ours on, a, on an upcoming Opportunity Zone project. I think they're one of the best in the business, if not the best in the business. They're on QSD Fund too. Um, I, I think they're always looking for. I mean, they're always looking for great developers, okay. and great projects, and there's a lot of others like that in the space. Although, um, you know, not that many. I mean, it's still a relatively yeah. small space compared to like the overall, you know, multifamily market, for example. But uh, well, Origin's great fund. Obviously, Griffin and Bridge are super, super huge and active. But yeah, Griffin is huge. Lot. Yeah, so I'll reach out to you separately on, on that point about yeah, that, you know, who, who are the merchant who are the merchant investors and and to um, to cut you know isolate those on the student housing thing. Um, I came up with a very interesting partnership plan that would let's say you want to do student housing in um, in Champaign Urbana, and the plan is to bring in the university to put co-brand the raise with the university and to milk uh, the alumni to fund that project, to fund that student housing project that benefits Champaign-Urbana where my father and my brother went to school, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you want to understand the power of being creative in a, in a partnership format with the nonprofits, um, and to really rake in substantial capital that I think is going to really ton it, be happy to discuss that idea with you. Um, sure. I call it affinity nonprofit raise where, 
where the universities also want to see student housing for life. They don't want to see these projects sold, but they have a key role in advertising it to alumni to pour their wealth into student housing that goes that flies the flag of the universities that they went to. Um, you know, if I could, um, I just want to say that that's one of the points of these types of group environments, right? These interactive environments is to come up with collaborative concepts and innovation, uh, because obviously there's a lot of area for that in and around this incentive. So, um, yeah. and again, I see, I, uh, I know, like, yeah, if that's not super compelling for us. It may, it may or may not be depending on the opportunity, but uh, we have a lot of friends in this business. We've worked in student housing for a long time that have done a lot of public private partnerships with universities. I know some of them have done OZ deals as well. I already mentioned one cop block at Annex, but there are a number of others as well. So again, I'd love to have those types of conversations. And if it's not a fit for us, then it's a, it's a, an intro or connecting of dots. Yeah. So I'll, I'll connect with you and Brad on that topic. Cause I have to go through Brett in order to, to talk to you. <laughs> Brett is the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper. I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. Um, very quickly. So the third question is, a lot of other funds are promising uh, payouts in 2026 to, to pay the embedded tax liability. Is that something that you make that offer, that promise or covenant in your programs to reimburse the QOF investors for potential tax liabilities in 2026? Yeah, I mean, every every one of our projects, you know, we anticipate and, and we've structured them so that there, we anticipate a refinance point at stabilization that with with a with a somewhat a return of capital uh, with a with a cash distribution at that point that we could then the investors could then tuck away for those taxes. Obviously, those are all projections we don't make. And, you know, uh, Brett's on here, we make no promises. We make no true, I mean, we can't do that. Um, but 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 all of the, the projects that is anticipated, that is projected, that we have a refinance uh, date with a with a cash distribution and return of capital at that point that can then be paid. It won't happen probably in 2026. If projects are under construction right now, that'll probably happen in 2024, for example, but it'll be out in front of that date. So you, yeah, we do anticipate that on every one of our projects. And, Hopefully the market will support it. So, so my follow-up question there is, if you're making the, the covenant or the soft covenant to reimburse them or to put money in their pocket to pay their tax liability, how do you deal with the fact that their tax, for each individual investor, their tax rate might be anywhere from zero to 39%. So how do you create equality of the dividend distribution when their tax liabilities are all over the yeah. map? We can't, you know, we can't do it, you know. So, I mean, the, the project will support, say, a refinance point that returns, let's say, 25% of the initial investment back to investors. You put in 100 grand, we have a refinance point, you get 25 grand back. That's, you know, we, we can only handle that at, at a project or a fund level. You know, everyone everyone's individual tax implications is on their own. I mean, we yeah, obviously we have an idea of what that, long-term gain tax rate is is for everybody and that obviously could change uh, in the next year or years after depending on the you know what's going on in the white house but um that we, we can't i mean we, we'll just return basically you know a, a set amount of capital based on what the project will support and the the hope and anticipation is that's enough for 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 everybody but we won't know that for sure yeah i just i just reflect that it, it may be some, for some investors, they may not even need the tax liability, especially if their tax rate is zero, and right. others need a lot more. So I just right. to, yeah. I'm and taking you know, a I'm survey of, of real estate people in terms of if they really thought that through, that not everybody is going to have the money they need, and and some are going to have too much money. So right. anyway, it is what yeah, it is. So that, yeah, exactly. So you, it's it's hard to kind of make that type of calculation. So and, and the other thing too is. You, you know, it's good. To, obviously, it's always good to return some capital and a, and a bird in the hand is good. But, you know, the, the true benefit of this program is really on the back end. So like you don't want to, you know, you, you want to kind of push capital proceeds, you know, to the back when they are tax free. Um, and so, you, you don't, like, let's say a project could, you know, there's it, it could refinance and return all the capital and more back to the investors. 
you know, that may not be the most tax advantaged refinance plan. And then that's something that we're, we're weighing, we're weighing right now on the first round of projects, which we're refinancing this year and kind of trying to thread the needle and, and, and have this strategy be as tax advantaged as, as we can make it. And, and Mark Sizz, who's a CPA, was on our team. Um, I don't think he's on this call with a lot of what he does as a, as a CPA by training and trying to kind of keep us in the most tax advantaged lane that we can be in. And my Hello. final, thank you. My final question is, um, in, and since Brett is the co-host of the uh, Compliance Zone, have you had any inquiries from the IRS regarding compliance and or in the spirit of true confessions, have there been any compliance faults that had to be shored up that you want to share with us? Either QOZB level, QOF level, <laughs> you know, the whole continuum of compliance. Well, the answer is no. With? There haven't been. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you. I told yeah, I, no, I, yeah. I knew Paul was saving it right till the end. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, knew, it was, I knew it was coming eventually. Yeah, uh -huh. we, we, we haven't. Um, we really haven't. And, 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 and truth be told, and if there's anyone on here that is really new to Opportunity Zones, or if you're a developer or if you're the the and maybe I shouldn't say this, but the compliance isn't. It, I feel like people think that compliance is actually more complicated than it is. Um, the, the code is, is pretty straightforward. It's not you know there aren't a hundred forms to fill out on a quarterly basis or anything like that. I mean they're, they're, it's a, it's it's really it's not as onerous as I think most people think it is. And so fortunately that means you know dumb real estate guys like us can still <laughs> stay in compliance. Um, and uh, and so it, it's, it, we haven't had any issues and hopefully we never will. Brett, are you going to, are you going to say something different? I'm just going to say, take good notes, Paul. It's, it's, it's <laughs> There's no notes to take That's on right. that. Answer. Okay. No, you know, hire, <laughs> hire great attorneys, uh, you know, have great tax, have great CPA and tax folks. I mean, that's, that's sort of obvious, but um, you know, and, and, you know, again, Mark says, I mentioned before, who's a CPA in, in house, I probably ask him on this stuff daily a question that comes up or an investor brings up a scenario that i've never contemplated before and you have to ask, i mean just yesterday someone asked us about making an investment and then they were asking about whether or not they could then gift a portion of that investment to somebody and it was like all right that's a head scratcher let's let's think that through and, and kind of run traps on that so there's the a lot of yes they can gift it yes they can <laughs> thank you very yes. much i'll be in touch with you thank you this is why we have the compliance zone too, right? Um, so that, yeah, it, it's available, this type of thing. Yeah, that's great. Right. Right. And I hope Brett and Mark are gifting it too? I'm sorry, what was that? Paul, doesn't it depend on who they're gifting it to? Because if you gift it to a charity, me, that's an inclusion event. Hey, Tyson, I always say I got to check the regulations. I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and here, great dialogue for the compliance zone session that's coming up in a week or so. Absolutely. Supposed to be Monday, I think. Yeah, so so I do wanna, um, I, I love that we can like, you know, get, talk big picture, get refined. And then I, I do wanna take a, maybe a step back. Um, Cause Bob was asking a, a question about um, what you include in your projects. And so, you know, if there are lifestyle and retail components that you find critical or necessary in some of these developments that you all are working on, is that a, is that a big part of what you do or? You know, it just, it just depends on the site. I mean, we've got some great urban infill sites. Um, I mentioned one in Chandler, we have one in Scottsdale um, that have, that have a, a commercial component and, and we see that as a great amenity to the project again kind of aside from the OZ um, and then the other you know the other thing I've been thinking about too I mean for like for our Scottsdale project for example Scott it's not a, a big amount but I think it's like 2,500 square feet of office space as part of that project um, and 2,500 square feet of more retail restaurant type space um, you know wondering if that will you know if we can kind of actively really seek a potential tent for that that is a that is a QOZB, um, and and will that will is that enticing? You know, is that you know I, I don't know. I mean, that's not something that we've really. The project doesn't certainly doesn't depend on. It. It's not something we've contemplated. But at the same time, um, I'd like to think that because I, I do feel like when we've talked a little bit about this, Chris, that the QOZBs, um, the true operating businesses. Obviously, there's you know the, the nomenclature gets thrown around a lot, but true operating type businesses, startups and whatnot. Um, they've really been overlooked. Um, there just hasn't been nearly as many as I think the uh, drafters of the program kind of would have hoped. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I'd love to see more of that. And to the extent that we might be able to cultivate some business or two in some of these upcoming projects, we, I, I would we'd certainly be able to push for that. And that, that was another question that came up about incorporating QOZBs into developments. And that's one of the things that, you know, at, at Osworks Group that even having the last year of experience uh, that we've really started to hone in on, right? Like how to get operating businesses on a track that can truly help them launch within this space um, and, and also come up with creative ways to generate gains so that they can participate in and not just be the holders of, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really interesting, um, bit of the conversation that, you know, as you say, you haven't really dove into yet, but, um, there's, there's plenty of room for collaboration on that front. Right. Um, so I think, um, Bob, did you want to elaborate on any of that? Or is that, did that answer your question? No, that pretty much answers it. I, uh, I think, uh, with a lot of these lifestyle projects, there's a, a good opportunity in it. And that creates a lot of jobs too at the same time. Yeah, it's really good for everyone uh, as far as you know, fulfilling the the promise of this as well. Um, uh, so I also know John uh, Vashon, you had a couple questions in here. Looked like some of them got answered. Did you want to? Did you want to comment live? I know you also have a project, um, you know, a real estate portfolio. Uh, but I'll let you sort of chime in and ask some of the other questions that you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Ryan, great, great stuff. And, um, you know, Brett, you and I have, have talked and, uh, you know, really respect what you guys are doing. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of funds. Uh, our project, you know, we've got 15 properties, Northeast Tennessee, always think where Tennessee meets uh, Virginia, North Carolina, really beautiful area, about an hour north of Asheville. And uh, tons of people are moving there. Obviously, the pandemic has kind of changed you know, everything, you know, the whole landscape of, of uh, the nation and what people are putting a premium on, right? They're putting a premium on housing and putting a premium on, you know, that they can go outside and, you know, kind of breathe fresh air, right? And uh, so these major markets are drying up from one perspective because people are leaving, uh, you know, it like crazy, but also um, just the, the, the premium that is still there, still prevalent in major metros, it's not worth it, right? You know, you don't have restaurants that are open, the entertainment, all these things that made those places cool are no longer there, but the premium is still there, right? It's still hard to do uh, construction. It's still hard to, to get permitting to do all these things, right? So I think, you know, I'm talking to a lot of funds that are saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're having to look at secondary tertiary markets. Um, it's out of our, our normal wheelhouse, out of our comfort zone, but, you know, we're really, we know that that's where we have to go. You know, plus we can get the entry price point, right, is a lot less. So the upside is a lot bigger. Uh, the social impact a lot of times is ingrained in those uh, secondary tertiary markets. Those are truly distressed areas that, that need economic uh, investment and economic impact, right? So, you know, with our project, like I said, it's 15 properties in a historic downtown, 206,000 square feet, uh, 13 million average is 62 a square foot, right? So they're like, yeah, you know, your, your thesis, it rings true. It makes sense. Um, it just takes a lot of, of, of time and resources to wrap our minds around a project like that. And, and honestly, there, you know, a lot of them that I'm talking to, they have dry powder, they have millions that they have to invest by June, you know, that they've taken in last year. So again, they're looking at it and saying, you know, 13 million uh, is, is kind of small. You know, we like to do investments that are like 20 million or more uh, because we spend the same bandwidth or resources on a 20 million project, 20 million dollar project that we do a hundred million dollar project. So that's right. <laughs> what, what town, what town are you in, John? Where, where is this located exactly? King, Kingsport, Kingsport, oh, Kingsport. Okay. Yeah. Right on the border there. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and I think, um, John, as you bring this up, uh, I think this is a great sort of opportunity to hear Ryan's thoughts as well, right, from, from an investment standpoint. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, Ryan, is like, you know, what is the range that you're looking for from a financial standpoint? And, you know, is there ever a scenario where you would look at something smaller than what your typical range is? And, and if so, like, what, what does that look like for you guys? Um, or do you really just stay right in this track? all the time you know no you know no i mean we we you know for the right for the right deal the right opportunity the right partnership i mean we'll, we'll look at just about anything i mean we're a smaller group and we don't have you know we're you know we don't have a a set 
sort of master fund that needs to kind of everything needs to check a certain number of boxes right we're doing each project individually we can we can look at different different things um and so we're we're certainly open to that um the really you know and and i, I totally agree that i mean true secondary type tertiary markets have seen you know especially kind of post pandemic here have seen much greater interest not just related to the pandemic but also just because of such pressure that you're seeing the major markets the folks are looking for for yield and so um there's been a, a lot of markets i mentioned like Colorado springs that we're in that you know have seen just much much larger level of interest than than they were previously where so much so many folks are focused on those handful of true tier one type markets for a number of reasons um you know so yeah i mean we we'll look at just about anything i mean we we you know, on the projects that we actually do, we we build them ourselves. I mean, we have an affiliated construction company that's really owned by one of the major partners here at JDP. Um, and so, when you build your own stuff, you kind of it, it's really hard to just bop around the country and really and be here, there, and everywhere. I mean, you know, we have to be really kind of deep in the areas that we're in. And and you know, and so when you you go to like up in Arizona and we open an office there, and you start to get these relationships with these subs and you know we look to go long on those types of, of projects and so it's a little harder for us to um to bop around to you know to a, to a market in, in tennessee or, or something like that unless we're you know, really ultra committed to it but there are a lot of groups that that will um and, and john you're totally right in that um most of the bigger funds is you know, exact it's it's, it's it's almost easier to put you know to find 40 million of oz capital than it is 10. You know, it's just that's just the way that way that it is. And so, I mean, most of our stuff on the on the smaller side, I mean, if it's five, 10, 15 million dollars uh, of capital, we've we've just syndicated those ourselves. We created a fund um, and then gone out there and raised it from individual investors because it, it is hard to get the bigger kind of boys to to come to those types of projects and that type of check size. Yeah. And it's interesting because, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what, uh, you know, some of the funds that I'm talking to have said. Uh, and it's interesting, right? So they're very, um, they're, they're banging their heads against the wall trying to figure out how to do a deal in Asheville. And uh, they love Asheville. They, they view it as... Everybody know, loves so, Asheville, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But again, you know, Asheville's already already reached the point, right? And so yeah. this is an hour of the mountain and the, the entry you know, point is like 62 a square foot versus say 400 a square foot, right? So the upside is much, much greater. Right. And you know, you know, my, my point to them is like, look, you know, if you could you know, rewind say 10 years and buy everything in, in downtown Asheville for 62 a square foot, wouldn't you buy up everything you could? So you know, if, if it needs to, you know, our, our project's 13 million, right? You know, if we, we need to increase it to 30 or 50 million, you literally buy up half a downtown and right. really do your own uh, blank canvas, if you will. So, right. I mean, I think, you know, liquidity on the back end becomes sort of a, it just becomes a little bit of a question mark, right? I mean, that's, that's what, that's what we hear, at least I don't, Again, I think that's changing a little bit. I mean, I think you've seen institutional capital buying, you know, deals in all sorts of smaller markets this past year that you probably can never see historically. So I feel like that is fading a bit, but that's always one of the big questions, right? Is like, who's the, you know, who's the buyer for this on the, on the back end? Because if, you know, if it's in Asheville or even better, if it's in Charlotte or Nashville or something like that, then the list is long, right? I mean, there'll be, there'll be, you know, a line of institutional capital ready to go. Um, on this particular deal that you're, you're doing on the back end, you know, that, that's a little more of a, do I, I personally, I think there'll absolutely be buyers for that because, you know, it's a great little part of the country and, um, you know, who knows what the world looks like in 10 years anyway. But yeah. that's, the, that's the pushback that we all, you know, we often hear if we're, you know, we've even looked at, you know, we looked at uh, a site not on the opportunity zone side up in Flagstaff, for example. And, you know, that, that's sort of the question you get, like, you know, is, you know, who's the back end on that? Mm, yeah, no, and that's a good point, right? So exits, right? What, what are your, what's your exit strategy on a lot of this stuff? And, and are you evaluating, um, you know, multi-asset uh, portfolios, right? Multi-asset development. Right. 
how you do in a develop yeah i mean that, that you know we're, we're just look we're you know we're just looking at them individually and thinking that everything needs to kind of stand on its own but in the back of our minds and when we mentioned this to some of our larger investors who are in a number of different projects with us for example is like you know i do think that there's a possibility i mean we're, we're going to have let's say you know eight to ten similar vintage similar markets type multifamily projects on the back end of this in 10 years that you know could be a pretty substantial bite of the apple for a bigger player that might have a little bit lower cost of capital and maybe there is a one plus one equals three there but we are really just contemplating each one on its own as an individual kind of a sale on the back end and, and i will say this and i say this on a lot of investor calls you know <laughs> projecting out 10 years of cash flow and, and then a back end sale price is you know just stupid i mean it's insane i mean we do it because you have to kind of have a benchmark to go off of but like it's hard enough to project out one or two years, right? I mean, realistically, um, yeah. you know, I mean, every one that we've done has been, you know, totally wrong. Luckily, the markets have been so, so buoyant that, you know, it's been wrong to the positive. Um, you know, we never could have anticipated, you know, 25% rank growth in Phoenix. No one would have let, no one would have believed us if we under up that way. Um, and who, so who knows what the back end looks like, but we do think there's a potential portfolio play for us, but if they're just individual too, I mean, I, I think these assets all stand on their own. Yeah, I, I, I'm loving this because, um, you know, I think, I think, well, Ryan, I told you that I, I had a call yesterday when we were talking about um, a QZB that is forming, that is um, starting to have to look at catering their pitch toward uh, a more real estate minded sort of traditional investment approach because a lot of investors are coming at this from that mindset, you know, and, um, and I know, you know, you, you all haven't dabbled in the QOZB, QOZB space, but, um, you know, there is this element of what you're looking for particularly, right? And, and a lot of it has to do with location based because obviously there's a real estate, you know, heavy real estate component here, but, um, I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of nuances in your conversation right now with John that can apply to those QOZB type asks and business models and approaches. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but it's just something that's been spurring in my mind. As yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we're, the, the truth is um, all of our investors, and I mentioned, I mean, we have, I think 431 investors or something like that. And, 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 they're all different really in what they, and a lot of them, to be honest with you, a lot of them are not real estate guys. I mean, we have a lot of guys, uh, men and women and investors that have come from, from the stock market, um, obviously had big gains in the last, you know, not so much recently, but last year there was a lot of that. I mean, I mean, um, we were just doing some internal math a while back. I, I think we had like 21 investors in, in our network who had solely, that was from sales of Tesla shares. Uh, for example, um, we've got a lot, we have a number of cryptocurrency investors, that, you know, so folks have come at it actually from a lot of different um, walks of life and they all look at different things. Um, almost categorically, they hate paying Uncle Sam. And so that's why we're having the conversation. Um, but that's really the only, you know, you know true um, common link. Uh, everything else is, is just wildly different. And so there, you know, there are folks that are very, IRR driven. There are folks who are equity multiple driven. There are folks who are really focused on what the cash flow would be. Most are not because they're, they're, you know, they're really looking at the back end kind of tax free capital event. But there are folks who are very keyed on getting a quarterly distribution once the project is, is stabilized. Uh, a lot of folks who are really targeted on yield on cost. Um, it's just it really just runs the gamut. Um, and so it would be kind of a hard thing to try to apply any real real estate, um, you know, QOZ investment principles to the QOZ B side. Um, Cause I just feel like it, it just varies so much from investor to investor. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, we recently did this, this pilot uh, with the OZ pitch track and a lot, of, a lot of the members here participated in that. And the whole idea was to uh, utilize a platform that could rank the investability scores based on crowd feedback on those projects. So, you know, there's a certain threshold there that um, we, we kind of put people in, in an available and more visible position. And uh, even one of the, the people who ultimately presented came through our DEI scholarships, right? So like true representation of, of OZ communities. 
And mm-hmm. uh, one of the things as you're talking about this that I'm realizing is that, you know, there's a lot of um, investors through even our network that would be potentially interested in seeing some of those businesses develop and when they get developed, be able to ultimately invest in them, right? Um, so I, I see a lot of tie-ins here, even though we're talking about more of the real estate angle, um, but, you know, a real commitment to the QOZB development is something that we obviously all here are very committed to and, and interested in. And I do see a tie and a common thread in all of this, um, especially as we like look out to the, the future, although the horizon isn't so far away anymore, um, that we can we can all kind of come together to develop this even more. So um, there's a couple minutes left. Uh, did anybody else have any burning questions? Um, I see a question over here on pace financing, which Brett kind of answered. Um, just uh, just one note on that. So we are looking at pace financing for another non opportunity zone project. Um, I'm a big proponent of that program as well. Um, get it in Maricopa County, please. Um, get it in Arizona, um, and we would look to utilize it. Um, it just got approval in El Paso County, where we have a lot of a lot of projects, but we're a little too late. We may look to do it on a future El Paso County project. That's Colorado, where Colorado Springs is. So it just it hasn't been a tool in our, um, that we could use uh, it, recently in the, in the markets that we happen to be in. Um, we have a little backyard project here in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan, that's not OZ, where it is pervasive, and um, we will look to use it there. And I'd love to use it more in the future. It just needs to continue to get more um, uptake and, and acceptance at various county levels across the country. Awesome. Um, and Brett, I, I want to let you chime in. We got a couple, like, just as a wrap up, I, I think there's a couple things you want to say. Yeah, no, I look, I just wanted to sort of make a point that really wasn't emphasized probably enough is that um, this group at Jackson, Year World, they've really, I, I think, done better than almost anyone um, evolving over the last three years as, as a sponsor in the OZ space. I've, I've seen so many other sponsors that, you know, kind of start and play in this space and, and really struggled to raise equity. And I just wanted to call out, you know, like at the beginning, you know, I think their model was was phenomenal. They um, they had a group of maybe ten or twenty, you know, relationships with investors, primarily in the Midwest, that wanted to invest gains. Uh, they they had a, you know really good connection with these folks going in. Um, it's all about the sponsor, as everyone says, and you know it's just kind of grown from there. I mean, their track record speaks for itself. The first couple of deals they kind of knocked out of the, uh, off the charts, and um, you know it's it's just sort of built on itself like a snowball. And um, you know I think if, if other sponsors are out there, you know trying to to do this sort of thing, it's you know it's a great model to follow. Yeah, appreciate that, Brett. Brett's best in the business. He's available for uh, your opportunity zone fund structuring needs on the legal side as well. I sent. Uh, several folks uh, his way as well, because I mean, I think he's, uh, you know, they're market leaders in this space. Brett's got a lot of experience in the tax credit uh, world, which sort of is a, is a perfect kind of segue and transition in the OZ world. And, um, you know, I mean, I, there aren't many other attorneys. I mean, Brett's structured, what, 10 funds now. I mean, and not many other attorneys out there that have that, have that kind of experience in this space. Maybe not. Well, I, I want to give a shout out um, to Brett and Paul and Ashley, who are all here, um, and also Gordon Goldie, who has participated in, is participating in our compliance zone as moderators. And so I didn't even know that Brett represented you guys, which is awesome. Uh, so when he first chimed in, I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, but, you know, I mean... The, the really neat thing about all of this, and so thank you, um, thank you, Ryan, for, for putting this, or being part of it and, and helping uh, kind of like spread the word. Um, but, you know, this whole, this whole community is about exactly what we've done here today, which is like lead with a giving hand, talk about abundance. I mean, the fact that even for, you know, uh, consultants and, and service providers are coming together to co-moderate these types of conversations, like it speaks volumes for the character and, and even just like, the, the, the whole sort of like community mindset here.